there and welcome to the Mystery Maven ESQ. I am Jess, I am the Mystery Maven ESQ, and I am an attorney for about 23 years now with experience in both criminal and civil law cases. So I've been into criminal law and cases and mysteries for a really long time. Um, I grew up and my father worked in the criminal courts and my grandmother also had a career in the courts. So very often I would attend court and watch trials from a very young age. Um, so in my professional life, I've worked both from the prosecutorial standpoint as well as in private criminal defense. And I've gotten both perspectives. And basically um, my foray into YouTube was during the C virus. And when that happened and there were lockdowns, um, I did a lot of reading before and I would read Reddit and follow cases, but I started to take notice of YouTube and to watch and then participate in the chats um, and eventually created a channel. So I noticed over time, um, even myself, participating in chats that sometimes what happens is that there is speculation that gets really out of control and it turns into something that's beyond speculation. It has its own life and it kind of spirals downward for whatever reason. And the whole idea of, um, you know, being careful in our words and recognizing that people are innocent before being being proven guilty in a court of law somehow gets lost in the shuffle. And we end up with an outright condemnation of these innocent people. And sometimes it gets so bad that it reminds me personally of times in our history where atrocities have gone on. And when we look back on it, you know, and we grow up and we learn about these things and we say, well, how could that atrocious behavior happen? And why didn't anybody speak up? Why didn't anybody stand up for these vulnerable people? And, you know, why would I have uh, participated in something like that? And, you know, you hope and you think that you probably wouldn't. But yet during those times, there were people and crowds encouraging and um, joining and endorsing what was going on. And sometimes I see the same thing mirrored here. And unfortunately, um, it seems like that's happening more and more. It seems like... Um, so often there's a downward spiral with cases and many creators, many of whom I really admire, they're reluctant to say anything, um, that they do notice what's going on, but for whatever reason, they don't want to say anything. And whether that's because it'll hurt their numbers, you know, if they rely on this for their income, um, sometimes people just don't want to be involved. Sometimes people fear uh, various creators in this space, but in my mind, apathy towards this is not going to effectuate change in this community. And I think that it's only perpetuating what's happening. And we're actually allowing the destruction of lives uh, to secondary victims of crime. And I think that true crime personally can be a great and powerful one. Um, this genre, this community can help support victims and their families, and it can help strengthen advocacy for the loved one, particularly in missing children cases we've noticed lately. But if things continue to go on this path, victims are never going to come here and use this as a resource, and they're never going to get support here. And that should concern anyone in true crime who is interested in justice. Um, I don't think that um, this is the first time that this type of thing has gone on just in criminal cases in general. I was just looking at a criminal case from the early 1900s. It was a huge trial that went on and it involved these two individuals who were murdered and their bodies were discovered under a tree. And believe it or not, um, the area was sort of cordoned off in some way and tours were being given for a price um, of people who wanted to go see where the bodies were found. And in fact, even one peddler would collect soil from the crime scene and put it in bags and sell it. They were peddling their bags of soil at the crime scene. So I think there's always going to be this human nature, this part of us that wants to see what's going on in these cases. Um, and social media makes it a little bit easier, but then sometimes it gets really out of control. And as an advocate for victims, that troubles me. So basically what I'm 
getting to here is that there's just an awful lot of making accusations against in innocent people, people who have not been proven guilty in a court of law. And the whole idea of that seems to get abandoned and lost in the shuffle somehow. Um, there's a lot of people out there who are kind of peddling like the soil peddler. They're peddling innuendos with like a wink, wink. And everybody in the room knows what they're referring to, but it's implying that somebody is guilty of a crime and there's really no evidence to support that. Um, and then you also see sometimes um, that that creators will antagonize people when they're interviewing them um, to antagonize them to seemingly bring about certain types of misstatements, perhaps. Um, I mean, perhaps trying to identify the vulnerabilities, but then antagonizing them to a point and then exploiting that later on. And, you know, the question that I have is for what? Is it for clicks? Is it for views? Popularity? Is it for money? Because it certainly is not helping the pursuit of justice. So with all of that in mind, I personally just wanted to do something on my channel that would perhaps help just raise the awareness of things and to hopefully encourage creators, but also people who consume, um, is to talk with a secondary victim of a crime, to talk about how all of this type of speculation impacts these victims, and to hopefully improve how we as a community can cover these cases by using truth and facts and empathy as a guide. So that segues into my video today. And today I speak with Julie Murray. She is the sister of Maura Murray, who has been missing this month, 19 years. Julie is a remarkable advocate. So I was grateful to have the opportunity to talk to Julie, not so much about the factual details of her missing sister Morris case today, but to really talk more about her campaign, this Engage with Empathy campaign, and to talk about how her life and her family's lives have been impacted by what goes on in social media. Um, the case involving her sister, this all happened at the same time that Facebook actually started. It was really the first case that started to get discussed in the forum of Facebook in social media. And so it gives us a great opportunity to see the perspective of a secondary victim here, to see how all of this has impacted her life for all of these years, impacted the search for her sister, um, and how it's brought about her, her desire to spread awareness about how it's you know a wonderful thing that the case can be shared through social media and to get awareness and to advocate, but at the same time that there should be a balance and that we should be engaging with empathy, just like the name of her campaign. So with that said, I hope that you will find this interview informative. I did it a few weeks ago, um, and I hope that all of us can get something out of listening to what Julie says, um, not just as creators, but also as consumers. So thank you so much for um, coming to my channel and for listening to Julie. But I'm honored so much to have you here today to talk to you about the campaign. And I know that it's going to be 19 years next month. And, um, you know, and I... I just so grateful to have the chance to talk to you about your sister and about what you've been going through, what your family has been going through and how that's um, affected your lives and how we as creators um, in social media, in particularly in YouTube, um, can help you and to help not just creators, but also people who consume to try to engage with empathy and to have more of an understanding of what the victims go through so that it can help orient how we present things. So thank you so much for being here. Um, but could you talk a little bit just about your sister, about growing up with her, what she was like a little? Yes, uh, it was a lot of fun. So I'm two and a half years older than Mara. Um, she was the youngest for a while until um, my little brother Curtis came along. And there's a pretty big age gap between Mara and Curtis. So Mara was the, the typical baby, baby youngest child uh, for quite a number of years. But Mara was, um, she was a good mix between my older sister, Kathleen, who was more artistic and uh, just real creative, and me, who's more um, analytical and 
uh, not as fun, definitely not as artistic. Mara was kind of right there in the middle. She loved music. Um, she was more of a people person, uh, but she also had that drive and had that analytical mind um, to where she excelled in academics. They came so easy for her, as well as sports. And so Mara and I grew up playing every sport you can imagine together. Um, we took a love to basketball and running. Um, and so Mara and I would run. A funny little story, my dad, he was a marathoner, so he was training for the Boston Marathon. And Mara and I would always ask him, we want to run a marathon, take us on a marathon. <laughs> and he would come back from an 18 mile training run and he would tell us, okay, I'm going to take you on your marathon. Right. And he would take he would us take on, 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 it was probably a quarter mile. It was so short. And we'd run this quarter mile with him as his cool down. And we thought it was a marathon. <laughs> and so our love for running came early and, you know, it was just in our blood. So coming up through grammar school and high school, Mara was a phen phenom on the track. She was breaking every record. She qualified for U.S. Nationals and finished 33rd in the nation. She rewrote the entire high school record book breaking all of my records and everything. But she was also so smart. She yes. just picked up math. I don't know where it came from, but she would just get it from an early age. Yeah. And she scored almost perfect on the SATs. Oh my gosh. And math. That's amazing. I think I had heard you um, show that or speak about that on your TikTok or one of those. Um, and I remember that you had said um, how you were at West Point and you were studying math or something and she was a junior and that she was helping you. I was like, wow, she's brilliant. When people ask me to describe my missing sister Mara, I say she was smart and I'm not kidding. Check this out. Recruiting letter from Harvard, astronomical SAT scores, a 740, nearly perfect in math. She helped me get through my first year at West Point as a junior in high school. Mara was brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. Mara is the reason why I got through my first year at, at West Point. Because wow. at West Point, it's, it's very much science-based and mm -hmm. you're taking advanced physics, calculus, uh, you know, all of the stuff that Mara is great at. Right. I just, I struggled. And I would write her and call her when I could, but you know, mostly instant messenger back at, back in the day yeah. is how we communicated and <laughs> she would help me with my, my schoolwork. She would just get yeah. it. And yeah. um, so when it was time for her to decide where she wanted to go to school, mm -hmm. she really had her pick. She had recruiting letters from all the best schools in New England. Um, she could have gotten into any of the service academies. Yeah. But she told my dad, I'm applying to West Point. I'm going to West Point. I'm going wow. to be with Julie. And she got her congressional nomination from Ted Kennedy, the same That's as fantastic. I did. And she joined me at West Point. Wow. Yeah. But, you know, West Point was, it is not for everyone. Right. And it takes someone more like me, more of that analytical, mm -hmm. you know, very focused, um, serious uh, right. type of personality to get through it. And Mara, Mara had all the academics, all the athletic talent. She could do any of the, the military tasks that were presented to her. Right. But she didn't enjoy that. And she was more of a free spirit. And so she ultimately um, got in a little bit of trouble, which probably right. would have led to her doing the cadet punishment of walking hours, which is the most archaic punishment that you can think of where you, you dress up in this the most uncomfortable uniform you've ever wow. you could ever imagine and you walk yeah. back and forth for for literal wow. hours i'm sure that it was nice having her there with you for a period of time so that's good yeah and then you went i know to uh was it umass amherst yeah she went to umass amherst nursing, and, right and, um got into the competitive nursing program and mm -hmm. our, our mother was a nurse 
Um, okay, mine too. <laughs> yeah, so she was following in my mother's footsteps, and that that career suited her personality much better. And you know, right. I'm convinced that she probably would have went on to be a nurse anesthetist or a yeah. something that required that higher level skill, which she just had inherently. Right or, yeah. you know, a, a, a PA or something like that. Can you talk about what it was like for you, um, as well as your, you know, your family, your immediate family in terms of, um, you know, I guess like we had talked earlier about how you're never prepared for something like that. But can you talk a little bit about how it affected you, like your daily life, your the practical aspects of your life in the beginning? And then maybe we can talk about how over time, all of these years, things have transpired for you. Yeah. The night that I, or the, the night that I got the call um, changed my entire life. Everything is, everything changed. Everything right. was different from the minute I got that call. Right. Now, I've often asked myself, why is it that that day and that call that altered the course of my life is unclear in my mind? Mm -hmm. And that's part of the trauma response in right. your mind and body work in, you know, incredible ways to protect yourself. Yes. And so, you know, people cast aspersions on my family because we don't remember the absolute worst moment of our life. I don't know. Right. Who called me? I don't know who I called. I don't know what the hell I did. All right. I know is I was panicked. I knew something was terribly wrong and yeah. my sister was missing. And I knew from the minute I heard that, that this was something bad yeah. was happening here. Right. And so from that point, everyone in my family's life has changed and we all deal with it differently. Everyone has their own personal way of dealing with this. And like we talked about earlier, there's no guidebook for how you deal with this. And there's also right. no standard way to process something with this magnitude. Sure. Um, and everyone processes trauma differently. So the way that I can best describe it is instead of going through the traditional grief stages, mm -hmm. the five stages of grief, yeah, because we don't know, uh, still 19 years later, we're still in this, under this ambiguous loss, kind of gray cloud. It, it, yes. It's always with us. We walk alongside of it. Right. I mean, I can only imagine because there's no resolution, like you're just waiting and waiting. So, I mean, how can you even process and move forward without those answers? So yeah, it makes sense. Like what you're saying. Yeah. It's, it's a balance between hope and despair. And we're right. constantly trying to walk that fine line. We can't right. get too high. We've got a new tip in. We can't get our hopes too high because the fall is going to be, you know, yes. very bad for our mental health. And right. we also can't let ourselves fall into that deep despair because we need to find Mara still. The way the stages of hope work, in my experience, are initially Mara is missing. Our hope is that we find her tomorrow, or yes. the hope is we find her today with each day that we search. And then as time transpires, the hope changes, hope changes with time. So after the first year, we didn't find Mara. The hope is we find her before another year passes. And then going into several years, the hope now becomes, we hope we can find out what happened to her. And then the hope shifts. We hope that we can find answers before people in my family continue to pass away. And now we're in a, a stage of hope where we hope that we, the secondary victims, we hope for ourselves at this point. Now I'm talking right. almost two decades that we're able to 
continue to live knowing that we might not ever know. There's this whole spectrum of, of, of just emotions that go along with that. I'm sure. I'm sure it does. It must be kind of like an up and down. And, um, you know, I, I, I can't imagine. Um, you're so strong to, to be sitting here talking about it like this. Can I ask you, where do you find your strength for that? Like, I mean, just how do you, you're, you're a positive person and you're, um, you know, you're such a good advocate and this whole engaged with empathy campaign to me is such a positive thing. And it's just amazing to me. And I'm just curious, like, how do you find the strength for that? Like, where does that come from? Well, that's easy. It comes from Mara. If, if, the roles were reversed. Mara would be sitting here talking to you about right. what, what she's going to do to find Julie. I mean, right. and the same is true for every one of my siblings. We would all right. do it for each other. Yeah. And so that's, there's no option because a lot of times as the investigation slows, the investigation, the burden of that is on the family members, the same yes. people that are deeply, deeply grief stricken. Yes. Are now in charge of continuing the fight. Right. And that is a lot of stress. I mean, it's yeah. emotional and, but yes. it, we're don't, we don't have any other choice. It's not like I'm right. not, I'm going to stop. And it's such a, such a hard thing to navigate, you know, all of it, like what we were talking about, like the investigatory process. And then, you know, there's like the whole legal thing over here and it's just the emotions, you know, and of course that's, finding your sister is the most important thing and it's just all of those different avenues and to try to balance that when you've never been in that position before and to figure out you know where do I go next um, I can't imagine how have you been affected in terms of um, you know so much attention to the case which on the one hand is great for awareness, but then those negative aspects, can you talk a little bit about that um, to the extent that you can, of course? Yeah, I mean, the the media attention is a double-edged sword. Families like mine in vulnerable positions, desperately in need of resources, help, our only choice is to go to the media, go to social right. media, continue to keep the case alive. In doing so, we tee ourselves up to be a target. Yes. And the reason why I'm so adamant about my engage with empathy campaign is because of my lived experience and going through that. The things that I've experienced and my family has experienced with the sensationalized, exploitative coverage of my sister's case, um, I don't want anyone else to go through that. And if I can speak to my experience and prevent it from happening to another family who's just as vulnerable as mine, um, that's what I'm going to do. Great. I, I can tell you from experience that that legal aspect has, there's a big void in true crime and families left behind right as well as victims is too because we're just thrown into this and we have no clue what we're doing we don't know how to right. engage with law enforcement we don't know how to help investigators should right. we speak up should we let them do their stuff we don't know how to when it gets to a point where there could be a potential movement legally we don't know what to do and and what what the laws are. My family has been lucky because we've had two attorneys help us uh, pro bono. Um, mm -hmm. and they have been tremendous, tremendous support. That's so good. Right. And, you know, we don't come from money, so there's no way that we're going to say, okay, we have X amount of money. We're going to spend it to pay for a lawyer or are we going to spend it to fund search efforts? Right. 10 times out of 10, families in my position are going to choose the latter. We're going to spend the money to find the missing person. Right. And but that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And so once, once we had a pro bono attorney come on and said, hey, you know, I do, I do a portion of my work 
on a pro bono basis, can I help you? And we were just blown away, floored yeah. that someone was so kind to offer us that assistance. And, um, and we've had two. So that's good. what you're doing is Excellent. needed and valued. Good. And, <laughs> you know, I, I can't say enough about it. So the campaign, the, the way I like to think about it is engaging with empathy, um, using the care principle. And yeah. it's a it's an easy way to kind of refocus yourself. And so we need to center the victim. And that's number one. If we're creating content that isn't victim centered, then what are we doing? Are we are we doing right. this to entertain? Are we doing this? for attention, what are we doing this for, right. if, if not for the victim? Exactly. Um, and then we need to avoid harmful speculation. Um, my sister's case is covered with misinformation right. and it's hurtful not only to Mara and my family, but also to the investigation yes. because there's very limited resources out there. Right. I mean, you know this. Yes. And if we've got all this misinformation, the people in charge of actually finding more law enforcement are yeah. off on these, right. these like rabbit, rabbit holes. These yeah. rabbit holes. And that's time and resources spent not looking for Mara or actual tips. Definitely. I think there's been such a problem with that, that you see law enforcement coming out now and telling people like, please don't come to us with things you've heard on YouTube or Facebook or TikTok or whatever it is, you know, come to us with the real thing. Um, so it seems like there's this whole, like what you were talking about, like the rabbit hole. And I just, I sometimes think like people don't understand the implications of that, right? Like the, that if you make the call to the police and you tell them something like that, that they are obligated to sort through all of that which like you said, is going to divert attention from the important things. And let's say they would get a tip on something that is relevant to the case. And, you know, it might not get the attention or it might get mixed up in everything or fall down. You know, if it's time sensitive, it could fall down underneath all of the other things that are not really um, credible tips. Yeah. And to your point, it, it's also very harmful when you're speculating about people on the periphery. Yes. So now we're seeing other people who are innocent being pulled into this circus because they appeared in a picture with Mara at one point or, right. you know, they, they were seen with just the, any sort of little interaction can yes. ca cast suspicion on someone. And if you, right are a creator and you take that and don't do your due diligence and you just post that, you're making this person, this innocent person have to, you know, fight against a public indictment when they didn't do anything other than we're in the same place with Mara at one point in time. You see it now, you see it all over social media where people just run wild with these theories and they're, yes. they're hurting people's lives. They're hurting right. innocent people. And you know, I've seen it in my own family where every single one of my family members and their private actions have been made public and it has caused irreparable damage to Absolutely. them. Absolutely. You know, I've, I've had my sister Kathleen, she passed away, but you know, she was struggling and yeah. she didn't have all of the best coping mechanisms and she turned to alcohol and her struggles with alcohol were posted online. And you can't imagine Kathleen is very quiet and unassuming and would never, you know, fight back or defend right. herself. She had to sit there in that shame for years. <sighs> and why did that further the case? No, it exactly. did not. And it, that was hard to watch. And I mentioned it on my blog about the campaign because that is that has been the most impactful thing that has happened, you know, as well as all the accusations made and insinuations about my dad. You have to ask yourself why. Right, why exactly, yeah. yeah. And how does that, how is that furthering helping this case? How is it helping right. find Mora? Right, 
And for those reasons is why this engage with empathy is so important to me. Yes. And I'm so passionate about it because I've lived it and I don't want to see it happen again. Any way that we can raise awareness about it and tell these stories just to give people pause to, to think, hmm, I don't know if I believe that just because it's written. Right. So that leads me to the R in the care principle, and that's research um, responsibly. Yes. Um, and what I mean by that is do your due diligence. Right. Don't just read something online and take it as fact. And also keep in mind that, you know, there's some people that are purported to be professionals who are just spewing misinformation. Yes. And so you've also have to peel it back and ask why and what are they getting from this? And it all goes back. Is it victim centered? Is it furthering the case? Yes. If not, then what is it? And you will soon discover what it is. I think if you keep going back to that question, right? And you say, how yeah. is this helping? How does this help? You know, what is this doing? Yeah. And then yeah. the E in the care principle is engage with empathy. Put yourself in in the shoes of the people left behind in the wake of these tragedies. And how would you like to be treated? Would you like to go on to blogs and YouTubes and see hurtful things said about your family and hurtful things said about your missing sibling who is now voiceless and can't defend herself? How would you like to um, be treated if you know you were struggling? Right. And so that's kind of the engage with empathy in a nutshell. It's the care principle, but it all goes back to the why. And that's how people, both creators and consumers can, can make a difference because you're voting with your clicks. So if yes. you're seeing this content that doesn't feel right, then don't consume it. Yeah. I am by no means saying that I don't want anyone to tell the story. That is right. not what I want. I want people to tell the facts and understand that you're talking about vulnerable people. My family is vulnerable. Right. I'm in a vulnerable position. Absolutely. You know? I need the help and yes. I'm struggling and I've been struggling for 19 years, right. but I'm trying my best to keep it from just becoming a file in a cabinet. And so yeah. there has to be that balance, yeah. not just allow people to tear down families. Like my family has been teared down. And a lot of times when you're in these deep stages of going on two decades, you feel alone. I've, I've felt alone a lot of times. Um, I, I isolate, I, you know, I do all the, the typical things that people struggling do, yeah. um, but I have found a group of other people who can relate to what I've gone through because I've gone through similar things. And that has been so comforting because I don't feel alone. I know that if I feel that way, that there are other family members who don't get the coverage that say Mars case gets that right. are sitting right here right now wherever they are and they feel alone and so as advocates I think we owe it to take our platforms um, and reach out and show those people some love and tell them that they're not alone and that's another you know pillar of the engage with empathy is making sure people feel safe in this space. It's scary sometimes to put stuff out there and be vulnerable and people sometimes don't want to do it and but they're struggling alone and we've right. got this whole huge powerful community that they can lean on. Right. Even if it's just a, a private chat or a phone call. thing I'll say is people always ask me, do you, do families want to be contacted or should we, do we just leave them alone? Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, families want to be given the option. Families want to know, Hey, I'm doing, I'm covering your sister's case. I just want you yeah. to know, um, would you like to participate or would you like to fact check or point me in the direction of something that is factually correct? Right. I would much rather, and I'm not the only one, I would much rather have the option and have the 
awareness that something is about to hit social media or hit YouTube yeah. instead of yeah. me like just perusing and seeing this awful right um, video full of misinformation. Thank you so much for being here with me today and for speaking with me and um, talking about the campaign. And I hope that um, that I can help in spreading that message to others. And um, you know, hopefully we can also share the story of Mora and, and find her. So thank you so much. Yeah. Th well, thanks for what everything that you're doing. You're a force for good in this space. And we need more of you, so I appreciate oh, it. Thank you so much. That's awesome.